Murdoch's New York Post has taken aim at him. Trump says that he is not to blame for the midterm performance, but some high-profile Republicans, they simply don't see it that way. Almost every one of these Trump endorsed candidates that you see in competitive states has, have lost. And it's, it's, it's a huge loss for, for Trump. I think it sends a message to the country, along with some other states, that this is truly a pivot point for the Republican Party. Uh, this is a time that Donald Trump is no doubt in the rearview mirror, and it's time to move on with the party. It's time to move on with candidate quality. It's an opportunity to reassess what Trump's role is inside the Republican Party, and are people willing to stand up rather than caving in on him? The question is, does the rest of the Republicans have the courage to stand up to Trump, or do they once again acquiesce to him? Because we all know him. He's not going to take the blame for this, uh, at least in his own mind. This is certainly a rejection of the MAGA base. The Governor DeSantis did it incredibly well in Florida. He just knocked the, the cover off the ball there. Um, and I think people are now saying, OK, we're moving forward. And if you just look at the, the Trump versus DeSantis stuff today, uh, it's a heck of a lot different than it was just three months ago and definitely a year ago. You know, I think Governor DeSantis is the biggest single winner of the night, and he will almost certainly become uh, the rallying point for everybody in the Republican Party uh, who wants to uh, move beyond President Trump. Let's discuss now. Senior political analyst and senior political correspondent at the New York Times, Maggie Haberman, is here. She's also the author of the book Confidence Man, The Making of Donald Trump and the Breaking of America. Good morning. I don't even have to say anything to you. Just go. Did you see what happened? I, I, I did. Um, <laughs> what I'm most struck by in that montage that we just saw is Newt Gingrich and the lieutenant governor of Georgia, because yeah. Newt Gingrich is somebody who has been incredibly close to Donald Trump, has been talking up his strength forever. A uh, lieutenant governor of Georgia is not a voice that we hear from repeatedly. The others are generally people who have been pretty critical of Trump. We are at a real inflection point. Clearly, the elites in the party are done with Trump. We only have to look at this to know just where the elites in the GOP are. That doesn't necessarily mean it translates to the base. And so I think we are going to see. I think Trump is at his most vulnerable than he has been since January 6th. But whether somebody moves forward against him, we'll see. What? what when will we know and how, right? I'm not saying what month, but what indicates to you that we will know if this time is different? Well, among other things, these races that are not settled yet have to get settled. So if Carrie Lake wins for governor in Arizona, uh, if Laxalt wins in Nevada, if Blake Masters somehow pulls it out, although at the moment that looks harder to see, uh, what, whatever happens in the Senate race in Alaska, because that was a key target of his because of impeachment, that will be telling. If, the, if his candidates pull it out, then it's going to be that he had a rough night in Pennsylvania and a few other specific spots. If not, then you are looking. And look, a lot of these candidates had tougher races than they should have, given everything. We will know in the next few months if, among other things, DOJ moves forward against him. Does Ron DeSantis start making more moves than he's been doing? And DeSantis is really the one to watch, as we just heard. Um, Trump is never going to acknowledge that something is wrong. And folks around him spent all day yesterday insisting nothing bad really happened. Something bad happened. We're just not sure what yeah, it means. What was he saying yesterday behind the scenes? Because I know he's tweeting or he's posting yeah. on, on his website about he personally believes he was successful, but Republicans themselves were not on Tuesday night. Right. It was it was for some people it was disappointing, but I did well was essentially his tweet. And, th and that's also not true, by the way, like he did well in some places. Um, privately, according to multiple people I talked to, he was very angry. Uh, the focal point of his anger was the Oz race in particular, because that was not a natural fit for him. And he was convinced to do it. And of course, he never takes responsibility for any of his own decisions. It's always that somebody, some, some staffer tricked him. And I think, Caitlin, to your question, this is something that I heard a lot of complaining about from people around him yesterday. You know, his, 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 his aides who are in his world, paid aides, are all insisting Nothing's wrong, status quo, everything goes forward. Um, other people are saying, how many years are we going to spend blaming it on staff? And so, and I think you were going to hear more of that as we go forward. One big question is, does it delay his announcement? I know there have yeah, been some saying, people, yep. even on the record, Kaylee McEnany, Jason Miller, yep. saying he should wait, not not do it, but wait until after December 6th, which is when that Georgia runoff is. They, they all, in his world think that he should do that. Now, how forcefully they make that case to him versus say it to each other is always the open question. Um, but that is that is the key date to watch for next week. He, I think, does not want to. A bunch of people close to him also are worried it will show some sign of weakness. But I, it, it's, he's going to get blamed if he continues to go ahead and Walker loses. What do you make of Mike Pence out with this op-ed today? His book comes out Tuesday, same day Trump's going to make this big announcement from Mar-a-Lago. Um, 
What do you make of him? He's, I mean, as Don's been pointing out, he's selling a book. He could have said all this stuff to the public, put it on the record in the days following January 6th, and he didn't. Or to the House Select Committee. Yeah, there you go. I think that this, this is, there, there's an alternate universe where this is his House Select Committee <laughs> testimony. Um, but that said, I think it's an important part of the historical record. I think that he and his folks have voiced issues with the Select Committee that, um, that they, they consider to be about process and how things were conducted. It's pretty striking, Poppy, hearing Pence talking about this in his own words. I mean, he is talking about, he confirms much of the reporting that's been out there already. So, yes, there are people who are going to read this and say, well, we knew this, except we didn't know it in first person from Mike Pence. He explains why he didn't want to leave the building, and it's not because he thought that he was going to be essentially kidnapped by the Secret Service as part of a plot. It's that he didn't want the image of his caravan fleeing, mm -hmm. um, the, or you know, his motorcade fleeing the Capitol. He confirms conversations that he had with Trump. He describes this lengthy pressure campaign. And then a really interesting moment after January 6th and his first conversation with, with Trump, I think it's five days later, orchestrated by, uh, by Trump's uh, son-in-law and daughter, Trump has a moment where he says, what if what basically, what if that rally didn't happen? It's too terrible to end this way. That's the only time I have heard of any real reflection from Trump, and it was fascinating. It's interesting that you read it that way with the whole motorcade leaving the Capitol, mm -hmm. because I, you know, for me, I thought, well, was this about optics for Mike Pence? Because he could have left the Capitol and still, with his dignity, and still did what he had to do, what his, uh, his constitutional, his oath to the Constitution. Um, but he could have also stood up faster and stronger to the former president, and it may not have gotten that far. He said, you know, I had compassion for the people. When I, when I drove up and I saw, you know, the people at the rally as I was on my way to the Capitol, mm -hmm. I had compassion for them. Perhaps if he had been more honest with the former president and with those people, then it would not have gotten to that moment. I don't, so I read him staying there as, you know, not the way that you had. I feel that this is reputation rehab for Mike Pence, mm -hmm. uh, this book. And I don't ascribe to the belief that Mike Pence is a hero because he did his job. We have to have higher standards than that, especially for elected officials, especially if you are the person who is second in power, you have to be able to stand up to the boss when you know that you're on the right side of history, the law is with you, and it's your oath. So, Don, I think there are a lot of people who, who feel the way you do. Um, and we've heard that criticism, not just about Pence, but a, a number of former Trump aides. The way that I have come to look at it, um, looking at everything that happened, and just given the intensity of everything that was happening during that three-month period of time, <clears throat> people in the administration, those of us covering it, it's sort of shocking to look back and look at how much was taking place. I am not sure. I, I think Pence is in a different position, so I agree with you that I think that if he had said something publicly, it might have been different. Um, I actually am no longer convinced how much of what any one person could have done. Bill Barr did come out in December and say there was no widespread voter fraud, and Trump just rolled right over that and looked to find other people who were going to do the job. In Pence's case, if Pence said, I'm not going to do this, then they would have just proceeded without him. I wonder a lot about what would have happened at the end of the final two weeks had the riot not happened, would Trump have walked out of that door willingly? Mm. Would so I, I, there's so many unknowns. I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that there are people, as I said, who do feel that way. I, I just don't know that I think that one person saying I, I agree is with going you. to matter. Just if you look at, uh, and again, he says in his book and in this, you know, the, the clip that the, this mm -hmm. op-ed or whatever is basically it's an excerpt. It's an excerpt yeah, from, it, from his right. book. Um, but when you when you look at what he says when he says, you know, I wanted to give people the opportunity to discuss legal challenges. There were no legit or legitimate challenges to the vote. There were no legitimate challenges. And what, end, and what ended, and right. Should have, that, so that's where people believe that he should have just cut it off there instead of giving oxygen to the election deniers in office. That's all I'm saying. I, and, I, and I think it's a very valid argument, um, but I, I also understand, you know, where he is coming from in terms of you get it. how... Uh, you can make the broader argument that this is what happens when you agree to sign up for working for Trump, right? And I think that that's sort of part of the problem. But I also, personally, as a, as a journalist, I am interested in what the former vice president has to say. Yeah.